In this lesson, we will explore the science behind external flow around bodies. External flow refers to a situation where fluid flows around a body immersed in it. A few examples include air flow around a space shuttle, air flow around a car, flow of water around a submarine and many others. The fluid as it flows around the body exerts forces that can broadly be classified into two categories, pressure force and the shear force. The forces that act normal to the surface of the body are called the pressure forces and those that act in the tangential direction to the surface are called the shear forces. Let us consider the example of a cambered airfoil at zero angle of attack. Let us assume that this airfoil is immersed in air moving at a given velocity. A sketch of the orientation of the pressure and shear forces exerted by the moving air on the body is shown here. Shear forces are a result of the friction between the surface of the body and the fluid. Viscosity of the fluid plays a key role in determining the magnitude of the shear force. Based on the surface area of the airfoil, the total pressure force acting on the airfoil can be calculated using this equation. Similarly, the total shear force exerted on the body can be written as shown here. In fluid dynamics, the general convention is to describe the forces acting on the body in terms of lift and drag. Lift and drag are easily understood if we consider a flying airplane. Lift force is nothing but the force that makes the airplane stay afloat in the air. More formally, it is the force that acts normal to the flow direction, balancing the gravitational force exerted on the body. Drag force, on the other hand, is the force that tries to impede the motion of the aircraft. It acts in the direction of the airflow. The thrust force generated by the engines acts to overcome this drag force so that the aircraft can move forward. Let us now understand each of these forces a bit more in detail. A lift force is generated because of an imbalance in the forces between the upper and the lower surfaces of a body. Let us recall the force distribution on the airfoil we looked at a short while ago. Both the pressure forces and the viscous forces contribute towards the lift force. However, because of the streamlined profile of the airfoil, the shear forces are mostly parallel to the direction of the airflow. For that reason, for streamlined configurations like the airfoil, we have relatively minor contribution from the shear stresses towards the lift force. The pressure forces are the major contributors. In general, the lift force on any object is influenced by parameters such as the body shape, free stream velocity and Reynolds number. Lift force is also influenced by the orientation of the body with respect to the oncoming air. In the case of an airfoil, this orientation is called the angle of attack. The lift force on an airfoil increases as the angle of attack increases. Let us look at an example. Here we have an airfoil designated as Naka 0012. Simulations were run at a Mach number of 0.2 and a Reynolds number of approximately 5 million, which can be safely said to be in the incompressible regime. Let us now look at the pressure distribution in the vicinity of the airfoil. At zero angle of attack, we have a symmetric pressure distribution on either side of the airfoil. This basically means that the forces on the top surface of the airfoil are equal in strength and opposite in direction to the bottom surface. We can also see this in the plots of the pressure extracted along the surface of the airfoil. There are two profiles in this graph, one each for the upper and the lower surfaces of the airfoil. 
Both of these profiles are identically on top of each other, indicating that there is no difference in pressure distribution between the two surfaces. Now, as the angle of attack is increased to 4 degrees, we start seeing the formation of a high pressure region as indicated by the red color along the lower surface of the airfoil. Simultaneously, a low pressure region indicated by the blue color is formed on the upper surface. This imbalance of the pressure leads to a net force on the airfoil pushing it upwards. We can also see this on the surface pressure distribution plots where we can observe a negative peak along the upper surface and a positive peak on the lower surface. As we go further downstream along the surface of the airfoil, the pressure recovers and is equal to the free stream pressure. If we now further increase the angle of attack, we will notice that the positive peak on the lower side of the airfoil remains roughly similar in strength, but the strength of the negative peak on the upper surface increases dramatically. As a result, the lift force generated by the airfoil is also increased. However, this does not go on forever. At a certain angle of attack, the difference between the pressure at the negative peak and the free stream pressure value at the trailing edge of the airfoil is so huge that the high pressure region at the trailing edge starts pushing the flow back towards the leading edge of the airfoil. On further increasing the angle of attack, the flow now no longer withstands these adverse pressure gradients and detaches itself from the surface of the airfoil. This is called flow separation and the phenomenon is referred to in aviation as TOL. Beyond this point, any increase in the angle of attack in fact reduces the lift being generated by the airfoil. Let us now explore the phenomenon of drag force. Similar to the lift force, the drag force also has contributions from both the pressure and the shear forces. Have you ever noticed a cyclist crouching down on his bike and wondered why he is doing it? Well, I'm sure it is not because of the back pain. It is in fact to get into a streamlined shape so that there is lesser air resistance which can help him move faster. The air resistance the biker is trying to avoid is referred to as the pressure drag or form drag. It is proportional to the frontal area of the body, that is, the cross-sectional area. For streamlined bodies such as aircrafts and bullet trains, the pressure drag is really small when compared to bluff bodies such as semi trucks. On the other hand, the drag force contribution from the shear forces, also known as the skin friction drag, is directly proportional to the surface area of the body that is in direct contact with the fluid. Drag is influenced by the shape of the object, the Reynolds number, and also the roughness of the body's surface. Let us once again revisit the example of the airfoil. Here we have plot of the coefficient of drag as it changes with the angle of attack. The drag force on the body increases non-linearly as the airfoil is oriented at higher angles to the flow. At lower angles of attack, the major contributor to drag is the skin friction drag. However, as the angle of attack increases, the contribution from the form drag increases. One thing to note from that figure is that even at a zero angle of attack, the drag force is finite on the body. If you recall, the drag force on an object moving in a flow was predicted to be zero. We have now clearly seen that this is in fact not the case and viscosity needs to be considered in order to account for the drag on a body. Let us now switch gears and look at analytical approach to viscous flows. 
Recall the governing equations for the incompressible flows. Since we will be studying viscosity, we will now retain the viscous terms. Very few analytical solutions exist for external viscous flows. Stokes solution is one among those. In the 18th century, Gabriel Stokes proposed a solution to estimate the drag force on a sphere in creeping flows. A Stokes flow or a creeping flow is referred to the situation where the flow is incompressible, the Reynolds number is less than 1 and the body forces can be neglected. Under the assumptions of creeping flow, the velocity terms contained in the incompressible momentum equation can be ignored. As a result, we obtain a new set of equations that describe a creeping flow around a sphere. Now, let us assume that the flow is axisymmetric. The components of velocity in the spherical coordinate system are shown here. Substituting these into the continuity equation and involving some vector calculus, we obtain the governing equation for the stream function. To obtain an analytical solution for this equation, we need the knowledge of some boundary conditions. Since we have a solid body, that is the sphere, we can safely assume the surface of the sphere to be a no-slip wall. Therefore, we have the velocity components as zero. For the value of the stream function in the free stream, we can integrate the theta component of velocity to get the shown relationship. In order to solve for the stream function, let us now assume a solution of this form. Solving for the stream function and applying the boundary condition, we obtain an analytical solution for the stream function. The velocity components are written as shown here. Let us now recall the momentum equation for the creeping flow. We obtain a solution for the pressure force distribution on the sphere. Similarly, using the shear force relation written in the spherical coordinate system and substituting for the velocity components, we obtain the solution for the shear stress. By integrating the pressure and the shear forces over the surface of the sphere, we obtain the contribution of each of these forces which when summed up gives the total drag force on the sphere in creeping flow. This is the famous drag formula proposed by Gabriel Stokes. We can further non-dimensionalize this drag force to obtain the coefficient of drag for the sphere which now depends only on the Reynolds number of the flow. Looking at the streamlines for this flow we can make some very crucial observations. The streamlines and the velocities are independent of viscosity. This is an expected result for creeping flows and mainly stems from the fact that the boundary conditions employed are dependent only on the velocity field. The streamlines show a upstream-downstream symmetry. This observation basically means that there is no wake of the sphere. This has to do with the fact that we ignored the inertial terms. The velocity around the sphere is less than the free stream velocity. The free stream values are recovered only at very large distances, that is, as radius tends to infinity. In other words, the presence of the sphere has a global impact on the fluid and not just in the vicinity of the body. The analytical solution for a potential flow past a sphere, shown here. We won't be digging into it in this course, but rather we will just use the solution for comparison purposes. Let us now look at the streamlines for this flow. It is quite easy to notice the similarity in the streamline profiles between this flow and the Stokes flow. The only minor difference is that the streamlines for the Stokes flow are displaced farther away from the sphere. The streamlines we see here are representative of a situation where a fluid moves at a fixed velocity over a sphere. If we change the scenario such that 
it is the sphere that is moving at a constant velocity through a stagnant fluid the equation for the stream functions will change let us bypass the math and directly look at the streamlines obtained from these transformed stream functions do you notice the dramatic difference between the two flows because of the inclusion of viscosity in the formulation of the stokes flow the streamlines indicate the dragging impact the sphere has on the fluid on the contrary because of a lack of the frictional forces the fluid in the potential flow appears to just move out of the way of the moving sphere instead of getting pulled by it a very critical issue that we need to discuss is that of dimensionality the solution that we arrived at for creeping flow past a sphere is in three dimensions however if we try to extend this analysis to two dimensions that is describe a creeping flow past an infinite cylinder we will notice that we cannot obtain a satisfactory solution this is what is referred to as the stokes paradox osin was the first engineer to point out to this issue and noted that the stokes solution is invalid at large distances from the sphere based on this he noted that the inertial terms cannot be neglected on this hypothesis osin proposed an inclusion of a corrected inertial term to the incompressible momentum equation based on this new set of equations the corrected drag coefficient on a sphere is given by this formula this solution can be limited to two dimensions and by doing so we obtain the drag coefficient on a cylinder experimental results have shown that these formula hold as long as the reynolds number of the flow is less than 1 that brings us to the end of this lesson this was a very quick introduction to the science of viscous external flows